Uh, thank you for coming, and what a privilege it is to be able to uh, fellowship together in the house of God, especially in this season, all right? Um, I, I felt like this is, uh, of all the time, you know, this is more than ever, it's the time that we can, we should come together and we should um, um, come in the knowledge and also in the assessment of the word of God because more than ever we need his guidance we need his word amen I want to share with you in this title of my sermon this morning is this too shall pass all right this too shall pass I am very um, as I was grappling with uh, what has unfolded lately you know the incidents and if you have a TV or internet if you look at the news you know I I trust that it won't take long for any one of us you know, to tune in and to came out discouraged and deflated, you know, or at least concerned. But, you know, I want you to know that God, God has got this under control. Amen. God's got this and we are not to worry. And as I was meditating, you know, I was reminded of an old gospel song. You know, that becomes the title of my sermon this morning, that this too shall pass, you know. Despite all the uh, circumstances, all the challenges, you know, all the bleakness of the events surrounding us, despite the uncertainty, I want to remind you again that this too shall pass. Amen? So, um, let's begin with declaration from the Word of God. Second Timothy chapter 1, verse 7. We're reading from New King James Version. Let's read this together, shall we? Second Timothy chapter 1, verse 7. For God has not given us a spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of a sound mind. All right? For God has not given us a spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of a sound mind. For God has not given us the spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of sound mind. I want to encourage you, you know, it's good to memorize the word of God, and particularly in this season, the word that Paul says to his spiritual son Timothy in 2 Timothy 1 verse 7 is a very fitting word for us. It is a very fitting word for this season. Immediately as you know, things begin to unfold, you know, things begin to make the headlines and everything, you know, my mind immediately directed into this verse, you know, I, as, it's as if I'm hearing a loud uh, speaker, you know, uh, within my ear. And, and it's always this word. It is always this word. You know, I've, I've come to know this word for, for a long time, you know, and I, I trust that you've heard this word for the longest time ever, maybe. But, you know, this word becomes so alive, especially in this season, you know, because it's, it addresses the very core of what we are going through right now. And Paul says to, the, to his son Timothy, God has not given us the spirit of fear. God has not given us the spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of sound mind. You know, I pray that that word will become engraved and etched uh, so deep within our heart as we are going through this season. We're going to go back into that word again and, 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 and meditate on that. And, and we're going to try to get more understanding of that, you know. But before that, let me uh, share with you a story, you know, that was published in... Um, uh, I think it was in uh, New York Times, you know, uh, back in September 18, 2017. They feature a story about this man named Stanislav Petrov. You know, he's a Soviet officer. He was a colonel at his time, you know, who was dubbed as the man who saved the world from nuclear war. You know, so um, actually when New York Times uh, put this on, on their uh, headline, it was... Uh, it was to rem uh, as an obituary to remember him. Uh, he's, he was dead at, 70, uh, uh, at 77 years old in 2017. But as I was reading this, you know, uh, I, I felt very intrigued because I think it is fitting to where we are right now. You know, what is interesting about Stanislav Petrov, you know, is that he's known as the man who saved the world by doing nothing. The man who saved the world by doing nothing. This is very interesting. You know, so apparently uh, during the time of Cold War, at the peak of Cold War, you know, Petrov was a colonel that was in charge of this command center in Russia that is the first line of defense to retaliate um, whenever there's an attack, an ICBM, Intercontinental Ballistic Missile Attack from United States to Russia. All right, so, you know, 
it was says that one day he was in his office and it was he was only there not an hour you know in his shift when suddenly all the lights begin to switch off all the alarm begins to blare you know warning of icbm coming to russia from mother russia from from united states you know and 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 the alarm was so loud and if you've been into well i've never been one but i've heard of my friend who who worked for raytheon says that in those command center when the alarm goes off you know uh, there are so many alarms so many lights you know so it's it's i think if we are there and if we are not trained it's so easy for us to be to be in terror you know and that's what happened so all the alarm went off so right there right then petrov has a decision and a split second what to do he and he alone has the power to press the button that would you know in turn uh, launch a missile from russia into united states and it turns out that the alarm was an error you know it was an error well i think it's an error in a biblical proportion <laughs> you know so it was says that many military duty officer might jump in to take defense measure immediately because that's why that office those instruments were there to begin with all right but during one of those most tense in the period of Cold War, when this happened, you know, Petrov first sought clarity of what's going on. And one thing that he was able to do was not panic. One thing that he was able to do was not panic. And you know, how many of you understand that when you begin to panic, that's when common sense goes off the door. And when common sense is out the door, then what happens, what comes out of you will be, you know, just, you know, rare instinct, you know, and sometimes not the best estimate, you know. So he, he did not took immediate defensive action, but instead he just, you know, inspect his instrument and he did not do anything, you know. That's why he was dubbed as the man who saved the world by doing nothing, you know. Uh, uh, he was reprimanded though because of his action, but then again, he defended himself. He says, you know, after... Uh, five nerve-wracking minutes, electronic maps and screens were flashing, you know. Um, he says, you know, I calm down, you know, I, I just, uh, 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 I just assess what's going on. You know, I know it, it takes a special skill for somebody to be in that room, in that situation, to be not panicking, all right. But thank God for Stanislav Petrov, you know. So in the end, when he was reprimanded, he says, you know, we are wiser than the computer and I know that the signals were in error, you know. So, this was the man who saved the world by not doing anything, by doing nothing, you know. Am I advocating that we don't do anything in times of crisis? No, that's not what I'm trying to say through this story. But this story, uh, I hope, will, will cause us to remind ourselves that, you know, panic is, is, is very dangerous. More than the danger itself to be feared, it is our Panic and fear that is scarier than the danger. So all this time, you know, there was an a, there was an adage that has been said a long time, and it sounds like, a little bit like this. It says, "In a time of peace, prepare for war." In a time of peace, prepare for war. You know, well, I I trust that our life will be a journey of, you know, peace and warfare. You know, if, if you are, if your life is like mine, you know, and I trust that everyone goes through the same, you know, typical, you know, uh, struggle in life. There are times of peace, but then again, there are times for war. You know, in times of peace, our job is to make sure that we do not slack off. You know, even in the time of most peace, you know, in the armed forces, they train regularly. They train regularly for what, what, what may happen, all right? In our times of peace, you know, we are responsible to, you know, fill ourselves with the word of God, with the truth of God. You know, we read the word. And whenever attacks come, actually we already got within us. We already got. And we hope that, you know, whatever it is, you know, when that pressure comes, it doesn't fail us. The system doesn't fail us. The faith doesn't fail us. But many times, you know, our lack of trust in God sometimes leads us to misguided action. Sometimes our lack of trust in God leads us to mis misguided action, taking matters into our, hand, our own hands instead of choosing to trust God. You know, especially in this season, you know, I want to encourage you this morning. We are right there, right in the center of that season. 
where we cannot afford to be panicked. All right. I trust that, you know, you all know that there's a deadly pandemic that is threatening us globally. You know, I mean, you have to be living under the rock or somewhere without Internet and TV not to understand, not to realize that there's a global pandemic, you know, threatening us. But you got to understand that it's not the COVID-19, you know, it's not that, but it is the fear pandemic. You know, this, I believe, it is more dangerous than the virus himself. Now, I am not underplaying the severity or the danger of the virus. But what concerns me the most, you know, is the fear that it brings along. And sometimes you got to understand that, you know, this is one thing that, that, that we, gotta, we can't afford not to pay attention to. I believe it was President Roosevelt in his inauguration speech that says that there's nothing to be feared than fear itself. There's nothing to be feared than fear itself. You know, and, 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 and I believe, you know, the Bible speaks the same way with us, you know. That's why, you know, the Word of God says, you know, He has not given us the spirit of fear. He has not given us the spirit of fear, but then again, He gave us the spirit of strength, love, and sound mind. In other translations, it says, a spirit of fear and timidity, or a spirit, it says in NIV, the spirit that God gave us does not make us timid. Does not make us timid. You know, the word timid is the very definition of lacking in courage or self-confidence, and lacking in boldness or determination. You know, I believe that we are not turtle. <laughs> you know, as much as turtle is cute, I believe that you know, the animal that would depict who we are. You know, we're not turtle. We're not one that shrinks back at the first sign of terror. <laughs> Social isolation. You know, but I believe that God has given us boldness. We are not to be careless, negligent, ignorant, and unwise, of course. Because there's also a word in the Bible that says, do not tempt God. Now, we cannot be the one who says carelessly, say, oh, okay, virus, try, try me. You know, no, we, we're not like that. But at the same time, we do not do everything or not do everything or change everything just because of fear. And, you know, and before you are so quick at saying, oh, no, no, Pastor, I'm not afraid. Let me remind you again that sometimes fear and what's quote unquote wisdom, it's a very thin layer. You have to be honest in the presence of God and bring it into the presence of God to be able to say and without doubt, oh, yeah. This is fear. Or, oh, no, this is, this is my faith or this is the wisdom of God. And I hope by the end of this meeting, you know, we will all be able to discern that within our life. You know, there's no condemnation, you know, and, and, and I respect it. There's been, I, I got asked a lot, you know, Pastor, are we going to have service? Are we not going to have service? Are we going to have service? You know, it took a while for me to get my own conviction. You know, that's, that's, that's what I want to encourage you also, church, that in this life, Especially as a believer, you need to grow your conviction. Are you listening? You need to grow conviction. You know, I mean, I'm, I'm so glad to be able to be a pastor in this church. I'm so glad to be your spiritual leader. But you got to understand that pertaining the matter of your spiritual growth, it cannot be delegated. You do not depend on me. You have to have your conviction, personal conviction. You need to grow it. You need to find it. There are certain people that ask me, Pastor, what do you think? I ask them back, what do you think? Because I already have my conviction. I already have my conviction. And my conviction is not one that is a result of, oh, you know what? I think it's nice to do this. No, 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 no. I can assure you that my conviction is through prayerful studying, is through waiting on the Lord, listening to people. Hello? Hello? But all those things adds up and lead me to the, to the arrival of this conviction. You know? And I'm not saying that this is solid rock. You know, because things are very fluid and they change by the days. I want to be one that is wise as well to be able to listen to the voice of the Holy Spirit. All right? But I want to encourage you, church, of all the time, this is the time that you need to be mature believers. You need to be mature believers. One time Paul rebuked one of the church, they says, if, if, if according to the time calculation, you are supposed to be the one who eats hard food. But why are you still on milk? 
I mean, I think that rebuke needs to also be sounded to us. You know, if, if, if you know, the extreme is always, always isolated, independent, you know, and the other extreme is overly dependent, dependent. <laughs> you know, God would want you to be interdependent. All right, as much as we have personal freedom, but we're not detached from the rest of the cell. We're not detached from the rest of the body. The body helped to balance us and to serve as accountability. The Bible says that in the multitude of counsel, there will be safety. All right. But in the end of the day, you are the one who must develop that conviction. All right. Now, you got to understand that, you know, God has not given us a spirit of fear, but he has given us the spirit uh, uh, that gives us power, love, and sound mind. You know. The spirit of fear and timidity, the spirit that God gave does not make us timid. Timid, it means lack of confidence, inaction, froze. You know, I know that movie Frozen is good, but that's not for you to act in this season, you know. Uh, timidity, you know, in, in, in my uh, word picture is, you know, froze. Just like a deer in the middle of freeway when it looks at a headlight coming onto him. Do you know that a deer... When the car is coming, speeding off at night, and even the car honk, you know, like beep, you know, and it looks at the headline and it froze. It's like, hit me. You know. Don't ask me how you know, Pastor, because we've learned it the hard way. <laughs> we've, we've had experience of that before. No, we're not like that. We're the one who have prudence. We're the one who have wisdom. We're the one who have boldness. When it's, come, when, when it's time to move, then we move. When it's time to st uh, take a stand, we take a stand. When it's time to, to persevere, we persevere. When it's time to, 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 to hit ourselves, we hit ourselves. You know, we have boldness and decisiveness. The Spirit of God is not the author of spirit of fear. You know, uh, since what's going on is a virus, you know, epidemic, you know, you got to understand that fear is like a virus. I study a little bit. On the mechanism of a virus. And I, I noticed that it's the same with fear. You know, to operate, it needs a host. You know, if spirit, if fear is likened to a spirit, you gotta understand a spirit needs a host. Spirit don't just work in a air like this, you know. No, it gotta rest to somebody. Because you gotta understand the devil is not creator, it's not original in their principle. But what the devil do is copy and corrupt what God is doing, all right? The Holy Spirit, you know, in, in the book of Acts, you know, we learn that the Holy Spirit, when it's being poured out to us, it rests on us, rests on us. The Holy Spirit doesn't land to a place. It doesn't land to a certain device. There's no such thing as holy microphone. The Holy Spirit rests on a host, on you, on a living being, all right? So that is a spiritual principle. What the devil do is the same, copy, corrupt. Fear, you know, is a spirit, the Bible says, and it is not given by God. And the way it distracts us is by, you know, looking for a house. Looking for a house. Can I remind you that every simple decision you do, it either pull heaven, it either pull heaven closer to you or pull hell closer to you. Every single decision. It's, 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 it's just like that. And, and the minute you listen to, uh, the minute you decide to depart from the wisdom of God, is the minute you begin to crack open, give an opening. You know, to operate, it needs a host. And you know, it operates from within. You know, a virus will always look for a healthy cell. Because without a healthy cell, it cannot survive. It needs replenishment. You know, from, from the cell. So it, 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 it operates from within. You know, that's why it begins with, a, with an innocent thoughts. Innocent thoughts. But it could be very blatantly unbiblical. It would be, you know, innocent from which standard, I don't know. Uh, it could be as innocent as a thoughts. And then it becomes an opinion. It becomes a belief. It becomes a practice, you know, it becomes a habit, it becomes a character, it becomes your destiny, you know. And one thing that I know about fear is that it's very contagious, very contagious. You know, I, I mean, I, I had to, 
you know, well, let me just not say the name or designation, but there are certain figures in my life who are responsible, you know. One thing that I learned is that fear is also learned. Hello? If you are uh, uh, hanging out with somebody who constantly are in fearful of something, it will rub off to you. It will rub off to you. On the other hand, if you are always in the company of people who are always optimistic, upbeat, believe the best in people, believe the best in their days, instead of, oh man, something bad is going to happen. The worst thing you heard that, stay away from that kind of person. Oh man, it's going to suck today. Oh, okay. Why don't you suck all alone? Don't, don't bring me into it. Don't suck me into your suckiness. <laughs> That's a clue, guys. The minute you hear that, stay away from that. Stay away from that. You know, it's highly contagious. And it's learned. You know, uh, uh, the danger of fear is that sometimes you can observe it long enough. And without knowing it, it begins to have a, a, a neural pathway. Is that the, tra- <laughs> the, the term? Neural pathway on your brain. You know. It's like when you are walking on a park or in a school... And then there's a green lawn, but to get to where you want to get, it is closer if you cross the lawn. But actually, there's already a concrete path. Well, uh, the the minute you cross the lawn, oh, it's a new experience, a new pathway. And you keep walking on that lawn, pretty soon, that grass where you trample will die, and it will create a pathway. You keep entertaining fearful thoughts, pretty soon it becomes a highway. It becomes a highway. Hello? Psychology 101. (laughs) And this is what I want to say to you today also. It is not easily detected. This day, we have so many terms to euphemize everything. Hello? The same way people can have the tendency to hyperbole everything they also have an uh, you know the same skill to euphemize to make it sounds politically correct or socially acceptable but at the core of it it's just downright fear you know there's no condemnation but there is obligation on our part to bring the thoughts of our heart into the assessment of the word of god hello The Bible says the word of God is like a double-edged sword. It's very fast and active. It's able to distinguish between our thoughts and our intentions. So, the fear task is to bring it into the word of God. You know, to allow the word of God to speak to you. And sometimes, we can go around or go about not doing the word of God with all kinds of rationalization. Get it? Rational lies. Lies that is rational. Alright? Sometimes, oh pastor, oh it's not wise. Oh pastor, it's not this. Okay. If that's your conviction, be blessed. I'm not one to condemn. But the least you can do, you must test every spirit and every thought. That's what the Bible says, isn't it? Test everything and hold on to what is good. My role is just to remind you, okay, have you prayed about it? Is that really? Because if not, we are at the danger of being sucked right in through the culture. Romans chapter 12, verse uh, verse 2. Remember, I I like that uh, message translation. Do not get sucked into the culture around you without even thinking. You know, that continually drags you. But instead, you got to turn to God. That will bring about your well-formed intention in you. You know. We are Christians. Are we not? It means we are followers of Christ. Are we not? It means we are people of the book. Are we not? It means we are people of His word. So why is it. That when it matters the most. At the crucial time of our decision. We never base it on the word of God. But instead we go with. uh, I believe pastor. Do you know that it does not matter what you believe? But you're going to be accountable to the truth. 
So fear is a virus. You know, and I believe that faith is the vaccine. And God in 2 Timothy chapter 1, verse 7 gave us these three particles in this faith. You know, He gave us power and strength. He gave us love. And He gave us sound mind. You know, God gave us power. God gave us strength, you know, to overcome fear. You know, I mean, just Google it up. Or if you have a software, you version or whatever software, Google the word fear not. Or don't be afraid. You'll be amazed how many times in the Bible it says fear not, fear not, fear not, fear not, fear not. Don't be afraid. Do not be dismayed. Do not be discouraged. God gave us the strength. God gave us the power. He says, I have given you authority. Since the day of Abraham, since the day of Adam, he has given us enablement, empowerment. Yes, it was lost because of sin, but then again, Jesus redeem it back and give it back to us. We have the power. We have the strength. God gave us love. I'm going to go deeper as we are going through the next month on this. Because I believe that at the essence of this, fear is selfish. Fear is thinking about ourselves. But that's why God gave us love. At the core of love is giving. It is our heart for the welfare of the people beyond just ourselves. You know. I'm not lying. I'm not going to lie to you. I'm afraid too. I mean, I have experienced fear. But then again, as I begin to worship, God begin to point me to the people who are going through this without hope. The people who are going through this without rope. The people who are going through this without anchor. And then compassion begin to flow in. Compassion begin to fill my heart. You know, I mean, would I just hide myself and stay silent when the whole world is going down the drain? And it turns out, I mean, uh, you know, this morning I wrote an article in Boston Globe. There was this guy, I, I, don't, I forgot, it was in, was it Tennessee or North Carolina? So at the beginning of this coronavirus, he managed to go to all the convenience store and buy all the hand sanitizers, you know, uh, all the wipes or all the antibacterials, you know. Uh, apparently he's got quite a business niche, you know. Him and his brother, they ended up hiring a storage they ended up hiring a, a u-haul you know but then again and then and then he begin to sell it and he's making a killing on amazon until amazon and ebay realize and they put a stop on it because it's called price gouging people profiting from a from an epidemic from a pandemic so uh, amazon and ebay even threatened them uh, if, if you if you are making a profit you know we're gonna uh, freeze your account so you know <laughs> They said they were stuck with 17,700 bottles of hand sanitizer and nowhere to go. Yeah, you can drink it or just. And then again, he's got the nerve to say, oh, I would, I'd love to think that I'm providing a service. You know, because, you know, I mean, yeah, I, I charge interest, but, but you have to understand, you know, the, the truck that I ran, you know, the energy that I spent. So far, nothing new in the commerce, right? <laughs> nothing new that I've not heard of. Thank you for your service. <laughs> See, that is what is so wrong, you know. But at the core of love, is thinking about others. And you know what? This is my antidote as a pastor to survive. Because the reality in ministry is that the more you think about others, the more you are worried about what's going on in your life. Hello? I challenge you. I challenge you. If this is not the case. The more we look unto ourselves, the more we focus unto ourselves, the more we are thinking about how to better ourselves, the more it's not wrong to think about our welfare. But when you consume with that thought, then fear begins to plague you. And pretty soon, without virus, you are already social distancing yourself from others. You know, well, actually, the virus is already in you. Virus called selfish or fear. 
But you know, at the core of it, Jesus says in Philippians, Paul says to the church in Philippi, let this attitude be in you as is in Christ. That despite his lordship, he did not cling on his special privilege, but instead he emptied himself. And he became human and become faithful. You know, at the core of fear is selfishness, thinking about others. But the minute you begin to align your faith in God, you begin to look at what is valuable in God. You begin to understand what is valuable to Him and it becomes valuable to you. And it is difficult for us to be Christian and not think about others. There's a word in 1 John. Alright? So, this morning I want to encourage you. You know, it's not that God hasn't said this before. Remember when God said to you, fear not, don't be afraid. And we just read it quickly because it's part of our devotion, right? I pray that, you know, especially this season, when you come across that word, you savor it. At least like two minutes. Oh, yes, Lord. Speak to me, Lord. Speak to me. Oh, yes, yes. Hush my heart. All is well. All is well. Because it's true. Why he says fear not is because there will be fear trying to compete for your attention in your heart. All right? It's not like he hasn't said it. He already said it. And in case you forget, he will say it again. Then again, the word that I want to share with you, John chapter 16, verse 33, says, I have told you these things so that in me you may have peace. In this world you will have trouble. But take heart, I will overcome the world. Amen? Can we read this together? Shall we? John 16, verse 33. 1, 2, 3. I have told you these things, so that in me you may have peace. In this world you will have trouble. But take heart, I have overcome the world. Amen? I, I underline the contrast there. Whether you want to be in him, or you want to be in the world. But if you bang everything on the world, Get ready for changes very quick. You know, it's like building something on sinking sand. You know, I, I noticed uh, the co this couple week, the Wall Street has turned to become a uh, six flag. It's like a roller coaster. <laughs> oh, it drops down. And then the next day, you know, the government did something. Oh, tests become available. Oh, now gain 800 again. And then the next day, oh, new uh, victim. Uh, were confirmed and then goes down again. And then Trump did a conference, press conference, you know, a gathering all the private sector, asking Google, the minute the name Google was mentioned, <laughs> let me ask you this, do you want to bang on things that is uncertain like that for your life? Or you want to bang on something that even though there's storm, even though you walk in the valley of shadow of death, even though there's calamity, but you will not fear evil. You will always have peace. I don't know about you. The older I grow, the more I appreciate, the more I understand the value of peace. And that it is beyond everything that any human being can put a price on. And you can only have peace in Christ. I have told you these things. So that in me you may have peace. Because in the world there will be trouble. So consider yourself notified this morning. That the world that we're living has problems. There will be troubles. You know, there will be perilous time. But take heart because Christ says I have overcome the world. Amen. Let's turn together to 1 John chapter 4, verse 8, shall we? 1 John chapter 4. I mean, I don't want you to just take my word for it, but I want you to go home with the word of God. 1 John chapter 4, verse 8. Let's read from the New International Version. This is what it says. 1 John chapter 4, verse 8. Whoever does not love does not know God because God is love. Let's jump to verse 16. 
And so we know and rely on the love God has for us. God is love. There it is again, second time. Whoever lives in love lives in God and God in them. And then verse 18, it says, There is no fear in love. There is no fear in love. But perfect love drives out fear. Because fear has to do with punishment. The one who fears is not made perfect in love. We love because he first loved us. Whoever claims to love God yet hates a brother or sister is a liar. For whoever does not love their brother and sister whom they have seen cannot love God whom they have not seen. And he has given us this command. Anyone who loves God. Anyone who loves God must also love their brother and sister. Now, it dawned on me, it makes sense why instead of fear, you know, to, to battle fear, He gave us not just strength, power, and wisdom, but also love. I think the most effective way to overcome your fear is by moving in love. Moving with love, driven with love. One is by loving God, and second is by loving others. You cannot confess to be a Christian if you don't love your brothers because God is love. So when it says that He gave us strength and love, He gave Himself, He gave the quality, the faculty, the characteristic, everything that is true about Him, He gave it to you so that you will not have to live in fear. And when you begin to embrace the love that He's got for you, it's difficult, it's impossible for you not to think of other people. And here's the important key, church. The more you think about others, the less you think about yourself, the less worrying you will be of yourself. That's why the Bible says, seek first the kingdom of God and all His righteousness. God is asking us to first seek Him, His kingdom, His kingdom consists of His people. His kingdom, kingdom, king's domain, it speaks of His people. You can't be a Christian and be isolated from the rest of the body. You can't. That's not Christianity, that's unity. I don't know if there's such a word. But Christianity can never be separated from others. That's the real power. That's the real victory against fear. It's when we think of beyond just thinking for ourselves. We begin to think. While we are busy of isolating ourselves in our apartment, and I'm not saying that we should not exercise care and concern, all right? We should. We should hit the word. But at the same time, there are others out there who are going through this alone. They don't have hope whatsoever. You can stay home and still be encouraged. They don't have whatsoever the hope that you have. They have to go through this alone. Do you realize all the kinds of fear that, are pe- that people are going through because of the business, because of so many things? And you, my friend, you, my brother and my sister, you have it in your heart, you have it in your mouth to speak the word of courage, to speak the word of truth. To bring hope. To encourage others. You know. When you begin to think. Of the welfare of others. The fear of yourself. Begins to be diminished. I couldn't agree more with the word of A.W. Tozer. That says this. A scared world. Needs a fearless church. A scared world. Needs a fearless church. But where are the church? If you're so busy of isolating yourself. Again, I'm not advocating negligence or ignorance. You exercise wisdom. But at the same time, we should not move based only on fear and concern. Our voice is needed out there. I believe social distancing is not social isolation. We grow in community, even though at this time we do community a little bit differently. Just want you to know that the service is also streamed. So if you are sick or you are not able to come, I mean, you can watch it. We have a link through Facebook. But at the same time, we still want to open this door. We want to 
we we believe together in in the service, you know. Uh, that's why I will now from now on more likely preach in the pulpit and back up a little bit, so you know, as to limit six feet, because I'm known to spread some. Anyway, a scared world needs a fearless church. A scared world need a fearless believer. Are you those believer? Are you that church? You know. <laughs> Amen. God has not given us spirit of fear, spirit of strength, love, and sound mind. Amen. Now the word that we kept hearing, this this minister to me. So that's why I want to share with you, all right? The word that we keep hearing many times, many times is wash your hands. Wash your hands, you know. If I, if I if I have a quarter for every time I hear that word, you know, I'll be rich by now. Wash your hands. And it's not that it's not true. It's not that it's not true. But as I was going through this, you know, my spiritual uh, alert, my spiritual alarm rings so loud, you know. You know, because yes, we have to pay uh, careful attention to personal hygiene. We have to practice hygiene. We have to practice a good hygiene. But what's more important than just your physical hygiene, you need to practice also spiritual hygiene. You got to understand that, all right? There's a word here in Luke chapter 11, verse 38 and 40, all right? This was when the Pharisees, you know, they go on Jesus for not washing their hands. Now, before all you dog on Jesus, let me just speak on behalf of Jesus. He's not anti-washing hands, all right? I want you to know that Jesus is clean. Hello. <laughs> Do I have a believer here? <laughs> no. Jesus not. But he's trying to make a point here. Look at this. The Pharisees were surprised when he noticed that Jesus did not first wash before the meal. But they were not surprised because washing hands before a meal is a good hygiene practice. But because that's a ritual, my friend. And they bang on ritual. They choose to elevate themselves by putting down people. That's why they put so much regulation that is impossible to follow. You know, and Jesus, which is the ultimate picture of grace that is not by work, you know, but by the grace of God, he embodied that. You know, he just blatantly goes through all those regulations and just eat. And the Pharisees are like, oh. Then the Lord said to him, Now then, you Pharisees, clean the outside of the cup and dish, but inside you are full of greed and wickedness. You foolish people. <gasps> what? Yeah, foolish. Did not the one who made the outside make the inside also? Duh. You know, I mean, okay, we practice good hygiene. But do you do the same to your spiritual hygiene? We wash our hands so that we don't get virus on our hands. But do you understand that the most important part of your body is your heart? We wash our hands with sanitizers, with soaps and water. How do we keep our heart pure? How do we keep our heart, you know? You got to understand that to survive this pandemic, you need more than just clean hands to survive it. But you need a clean heart. And, you know, the word of God has the ability. The word of God is the antiseptic to our heart. You know, John 15, 3, you know, would tell you how, you know, Jesus says that, you know, you have been clean because of the word that have been spoken to you. Ephesians, you know, when... When it was Paul was given an analogy about how a husband love must love their wife, he used the analogy of how the analogy of how Christ loved the church by giving himself to the church and make her holy and clean, washed by the cleansing of God's word. Church, are you listening? The word of God is important. You know, as much as you carry hand sanitizer on your pocket. Or on, on your man purse, if you're a man. Or whatever it is. You got to carry the word of God in your heart. Because if we don't do that, we will not survive this pandemic of fear. 
you know. We have got to do this, you know, as much as we do the physical hygiene practice, we got to also do our spiritual hygiene practice. Amen. Psalm 46, verse 1 to 2. God is our refuge and strength, a very present help in trouble. Therefore, we will not fear, even though the earth be removed, and though the mountains be carried into the midst of the sea. God is our refuge and strength, a very present help in trouble. Therefore, we will not fear. Even though the earth be removed, and though the mountains be carried into the midst of the sea. I pray that this word will ring through to you and will become a rhema to you. God is our refuge. Anything that can happen or will happen or already happen. God is our refuge. God is our refuge. School is canceled. I don't know whether to say yes or oh. All the parents are in limbo right now because if they have to work, you know. Economy is slowing down. Everything is close, you know. Everything is slowing down. Everything is uncertain. You know. Nations in lockdown. If you know the amount of tax I receive from parents all over the world, you know, all over the world, I mean Indonesia, <laughs> specifically Surabaya, <laughs> no, 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 Jakarta also, and Singapore, <laughs> you know, but I'm a parent myself, I can imagine, I can imagine. I can imagine. But then again, this is what I can say to you. Make God your refuge. Make Him your refuge. Make Him your strength. And He's a very present help in trouble. He's a very present help in trouble. I promise you, He will not fail you. Even though the earth be removed, even though the mountains be carried into the midst, of the sea. Amen, church? God has not given us spirit of fear, spirit of strength, love, and sound mind. It's not fear that He gave. He gave us faith. Gave us strength to act. Gave us strength to make decision. Gave us love to be more connected to Him and connected to others, to care for other people. Gave us wisdom. Self-discipline. Sound mind also means self-discipline. So if you don't have to be in a crowd, you don't have to be somewhere that you don't need to. You don't need to. You know, you got to exercise self-control. That's part of faith. So I want to encourage you, church. This too will pass. This too will pass. Trust in the Word. Trust in God. You know, He has overcome the world. Amen. I let me close with the story of uh, Pastor. In LA, uh, Pastor Erwin McManus is one of the pastor of a, a great church in LA. He shared his story from when 9/11 took place. You know, he says that when 9/11 took place, he went home and he was not prepared for the evil that he was to witness through TV. And if you were here in America during those times, you know what I'm talking about. You know how. You know, we are glued to TV and the TV seems to replay, you know, I, I, it's still fresh on my mind to seeing how the, the flight, you know, the, the plane hit the Twin Towers, you know, it's, it's, they keep replaying it. Back, back then, there's still CNN headlines. Do we still have it now? Yeah. So it's, it's just replaying headlines, headlines. So he says, uh, it was so depressed. And then the next day, his wife told him, Erwin, you better speak to your kids at that time his kids was 13 and 9 you better speak to them because they are very impacted of this you better talk to them you know you better talk to them and, and give them you know uh, somewhat an explanation <laughs> let me read to you what he says this is what he says you know at that time so the next morning you know he says I remember sitting down with my kids now now I knew what I wanted to tell them I wanted to tell them that 
the old cliche, oh, the safest place to be is in the center of God's will. Haven't you heard that? The safest place to be is in the center of the will of God. It's so beautiful. It's just, you know. I wanted to tell them, look, we're Christian. We're followers of Jesus Christ. So this would not happen on us. We're on the other side of the country. It's really, really far away. <laughs> if you just walk with Christ, you don't have anything to worry about. In fact, what I wanted to do was give them a good old Christian life. But I know that that's not the truth. And I know that right there, right then, I had to tell the truth to my kids, even at that age. And so I told my children that morning that what we learn is that we have no control over when we die or even how we die. But what we have control over is how we live. We have no control over when we die or even how we die. But what we have control over is how we live. Oh, what a depressing sentence to end and to, to, to finish the sermon. But that's the truth. I don't want to sugarcoat it for you. But this is good news, actually. This is good news. One thing that we can consider is how we're going to live. One day, history will be retold. What is it going to say about you throughout this crisis? Are you going to be one that stands with strength, love, and wisdom? Are you going to be known as somebody who takes refuge in God and in His strength? Are you going to be known as somebody who fear not and love fully? Or are you going to be known as hoarders? Are you going to be known as those who isolate themselves? Are you going to be known as somebody who lives in terror? We don't know how we're going to die or when we're going to die. We can't control it. But I want to encourage you this morning, church. We have choice. We can control how we're going to live. And I pray this morning that you're going to choose to live on the side of faith, on the side of His grace, on the side of His kingdom and His mercy and His mission and His purpose. Because life is too short to just be worried about ourselves. Amen. The Bible says if you try to keep your life, you're going to lose it. But if you lose it for me, you will gain it back. Well, to begin with, this life is not ours. He died on the cross and bought us. He redeemed full price. Let's live our life for Him. Let's not shrink back into fear. But let's move boldly. By faith, Because God has a glorious purpose in you and I. He's not finished. You know, we are going to emerge victoriously. Amen. Now let's move with wisdom. Let's move with, you know, caution. But don't shrink back because of fear. Do what is necessary. Look for the need of others and try to fill it. Don't live for yourself. The more you look on yourself, the more you will be fearful of yourself. But the minute you start thinking of other people, the minute you are going to, your faith will start to emerge. Father, I pray this morning that faith will truly arise in this place. That hope will thrive in this place. Father, I pray this morning that your people will receive your word and choose to side with you to be bold, to be brave. To walk in faith because you have given us strength, courage. You have given us love, the capacity to love. And you have given us sound mind, self-discipline. Father, help us. That this moment becomes the moment that we grow closer to you. That we are drawn closer to you. That we experience you more and more. Father, help us not to just focus a good personal hygiene. But that we also practice on spiritual hygiene. 
that we guard our heart, that we make sure that our heart is sanitized from the virus of fear, that we make sure, oh God, that that we isolate ourselves from the vicinity of fear, because fear pandemic is real. It's deadlier than coronavirus. And Lord, you don't want us to live by fear. Help us, oh God, to sanitize our heart, understanding, Lord Jesus. And the way to do that, oh God, is by your word, is through your word. Help us to emerge ourselves in your word. Help us to love your word. Help us to read your word, believe in your word. Help us, oh God, to meditate on your word. Help us to go into the fellowship of believers that focus on your word. Help us to focus on your word. The only word that gives life. The only word that gives hope. The only word that gives faith. The only word that heals. The only word that nourish. The only light in this darkness. Your word, oh God. Your word is a lamp unto our feet and a light unto our path. Teach us to live your word, to love your word like never before. If there's ever for us to feed on, to do repeatedly, O oh God, is the washing of our heart, our mind, by your word. Help us, O oh God. Help us to realize that you are our refuge and strength. A very present help in trouble. Therefore, we will not fear. Therefore, we will not fear, oh God. Because we believe in you, Jesus. In you, we are alive. In you, we are redeemed. In you, we are refreshed. In you, we have hope, oh God. I have told you these things so that in me, you may have peace. In this world, you will have trouble. But take heart, because I have overcome this world. We declare and we believe that this too shall pass, Lord. This too shall pass. We thank you, Lord. We receive this in Jesus' name. Amen.